Act 1 of The Sorcerer by W.S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Sir Marmaduke Poindexter, an elderly baronet. Read by Andrew Kennedy Alexis of the Grenadier Guards His Son Read by R. W. Raptor Dr. Daly, Vicar of Plovelay Read by Scotty Smith John Wellington Wells Of J. W. Wells and Company Family Sorcerers Read by Todd The Notary Read by Tchaikovsky Lady Sangajour, a lady of ancient lineage, read by April Mendes. Aline, her daughter, betrothed to Alexis, read by Annie Mars. Mrs. Parley, a pew opener, read by T.J. Burns. Constance, her daughter, read by Jen Broda. Chorus, female, read by Mira Williams. Male chorus, read by Alan Mapstone. Page, read by Lauren Emma. Stage directions, read by Michelle Eaton. Act One. Scene, Garden of Sir Marmaduke's Elizabethan Mansion. The end of a large marquee, open and showing portion of table covered with white cloth, on which are joints of meat, teapots, cups, bread and butter, jam, etc. To the back of raised terrace with steps. A park in the background with spire of church, seen above the trees. Chorus of Peasantry Ring forth ye bells with, with clarion sound, Forget your knells, for joys abound. Forget your notes of mournful lay, And from your throats for joy today. For today, young Alexis, young Alexis Poindexter, is betrothed to a line to a line sanguisor, and that pride of his sexes, of his sexes to be next her at the feast on the green, on the green, oh be sure. Ring forth ye bells with clarion sound, forget your knells, for joys abound. Forget your notes of mournful lay, and from your throats pour joy today. At the end of chorus, exeunt the men into house. Enter Mrs. Partlet, meeting Constance, her daughter. Constance, my daughter, why this strange depression? The village rings with seasonable joy because the young and amiable Alexis, heir to the great Sir Marmaduke Point Dexter, is plighted to Aline, the only daughter of Annabella, Lady Sangazur. You, you alone are sad and out of spirits. What is the reason? Speak, my daughter, speak. Oh, mother, do not ask. If my complexion from red to white should change in quick succession, and then from white to red, oh, take no notice. If my poor limbs shall tremble with emotion, Pay no attention, mother, it is nothing. If long and deep-drawn sighs I chance to utter, Oh, heed them not, their cause must ne'er be known. My child, be candid. Think not to deceive the eagle-eyed pew-opener. You love. Constance aside. How guessed she that, my heart's most cherished secret? I do love, fondly. Madly, hopelessly. When he is here, I sigh with pleasure. When he is gone, I sigh with grief. My hopeless fear no soul can measure. His love alone can give my aching heart relief. When he is cold, I weep for sorrow. When he is kind, I weep for joy. My grief untold knows no tomorrow, my woe confined, no hope, no solace, no alloy. At the end of the song, Mrs. Partlet silently motions to women to leave them together. Exeunt chorus. 
Come, tell me all about it. Do not fear. I too have loved, but that was long ago. Who is the object of your young affections? Hush, mother, here he is. Enter Dr. Daly. He is pensive and does not see them. He sits on stool. Mrs. Parklet, amazed. A reverend vicar. Oh, pity me. My heart is almost broken. My child, be comforted. To such a union I shall not offer any opposition. Take him, he's yours. May you and he be happy. But, mother dear, he is not yours to give. That's true, indeed. He might object. He might. But come, take heart. I'll probe him on the subject. Be comforted. Leave this affair to me. Recitative, Dr. Daly. The air is charged with amatory numbers, soft madrigals and dreamy lovers' lays. Peace, peace, old heart. Why waken from its slumbers the aching memory of the old, old days? Ballad. Time was when love and I were well acquainted. Time was when we walked ever hand in hand, a saintly youth with worldly thought untainted, none better loved than I in all the land. Time was when maidens of the noblest station, forsaking even military men, would gaze upon me wrapped in adoration. Ah, me! I was a fair young curate then. Had I a headache? Sighed the maze assembled. Had I a cold? Welled forth the silent tear. Did I look pale? Then half a parish trembled. And when I coughed, all thought the end was near. I had no care, no jealous doubts hung over me, for I was loved beyond all other men, fled gilded dukes and belted earls before me. Ah, me, I was a pale young curate then. At the conclusion of the ballad, Mrs. Parklet comes forward with Constance. Good day, reverend sir. Ah, good Mrs. Parklet, I am glad to see you. And your little daughter, Constance. Why, she is quite a little woman, I declare. Constance aside. Oh, mother, I cannot speak to him. Yes, reverend sir, she is nearly eighteen, and as good a girl as ever stepped. Aside to Dr. Daly. Ah, sir, I am afraid I shall soon lose her. Dr. Daly aside to Mrs. Parklet. Dear me, you pain me very much. Is she delicate? Oh, no, sir. I don't mean that. But young girls look to get married. Oh, I take you, to be sure. But there's plenty of time for that. Four or five years hence, Mrs. Parklet, four or five years hence. But when the time does come... I shall have much pleasure in marrying her myself. Constance aside. Oh, mother! To some strapping young fellow in her own rank of life. Constance in tears. He does not love me. I have often wondered, Reverend Sir, if you'll excuse me the liberty, that you have never married. Dr. Daly aside. Be still, my fluttering heart. A clergyman's wife does so much good in a village. Besides that, you are not so young as you were, and before very long you will want somebody to nurse you and look after your little comforts. Mrs. Partlet, there is much truth in what you say. I am indeed getting on in years, and a helpmate would cheer my declining days. Time was when it might have been, but I have left it too long. I'm an old fogey now, am I not, my dear? To Constance. A very old fogey indeed. <laughs> no, Mrs. Partlet, my mind is quite made up. I shall live and die a solitary old bachelor. Oh, mother, mother. Sobs on Mrs. Partlet's bosom. Come, come, dear one, don't fret. At a more fitting time, we will try again. 
We will try again. Exeunt Mrs. Partlet and Constance. Dr. Daly looking after them. Poor little girl. I'm afraid she has something on her mind. She is rather comely. Time was when this old heart would have throbbed in double time at the sight of such a fairy form. But tush, I am pooling. Here come the young Alexis with his proud and happy father. Let me dry this tell-tale tear. Enter Sir Marmaduke and Alexis from house. Sir Marmaduke, my dear young friend Alexis, on this most happy, most auspicious plighting, permit me, as a true old friend, to tender my best, my very best congratulations. Sir, you are most obliging. Dr. Daly, my dear old tutor and my valued pastor, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. May fortune bless you. May the middle distance of your young life be pleasant as the foreground, the joyous foreground. And when you have reached it, may that which now is the far-off horizon, but which will then become the middle distance in fruitful promise, be exceeded only by that which will have opened in the meantime into a new and glorious horizon. Dear Sir, that is an excellent example of an old school of stately compliment, to which I have through life been much addicted. Will you oblige me with a copy of it in clerkly manuscript, that I myself may use it on appropriate occasions? Sir, you shall have a fairly written copy, ere soul has sunk into his western slumbers. Exit, Dr. Daly. The Marmaduke to Alexis, who is in a reverie. Come, come, my son. Your fiancé will be here in five minutes. Rouse yourself to receive her. Alexis, rising. Oh, rapture. Yes, you are a fortunate young fellow. And I will not disguise from you that this union with the house of Sangajor realizes my fondest wishes. Aline is rich and she comes of a sufficiently old family, for she is the 7,037th in direct descent from Helen of Troy. True, there was a blot on the escutcheon of that lady, that affair with Paris. But where is the family, other than my own, in which there is no flaw? You are a lucky fellow, sir. A very lucky fellow. Father, I am welling over with limpid joy. No sickling taint of sorrow overlies the lucid lake of liquid love, upon which, hand in hand, Eileen and I are to float into eternity. Alexis, I desire that of your love for this young lady you do not speak so openly. You are always singing ballads in praise of her beauty, and you expect the very menials who wait behind your chair to chorus your ecstasies. It is not delicate father a man who loves as i love pooh pooh sir fifty years ago i madly loved your future mother-in-law the lady sangajour and i have reason to believe that she returned my love but were we guilty of the indelicacy of publicly rushing into each other's arms exclaiming oh my adored one beloved boy Ecstatic rapture, unmingled joy, which seemed to be the modern fashion of love-making? No, it was. Madame, I trust you are in the enjoyment of good health. Sir, you are vastly polite. I protest I am mighty well. And so forth. Much more delicate. Much more respectful. But see, Aline approaches. Let us retire, that she may compose herself for the interesting ceremony in which she is to play so important a part. Exeunt Sir Marmaduke into house. Enter Aline, preceded by chorus of girls. With heart and with voice let us welcome this mating, to the youth of her choice with a heart palpitating, comes the lovely Aline. May their love never cloy, may their bliss be unbounded, 
with a halo of joy may their lives be surrounded. Heaven bless our Aline. Recitative Aline My kindly friends, I thank you for this greeting, and as you wish me every earthly joy, I trust your wishes may have quick fulfilment. O oh, happy heart, comes thy young lord a wooing, with joy in his eyes and pride in his breast, make much of thy prize, for he is the best that ever came a suing. Yet, yet we must part, young heart, yet, yet we must part. O oh, merry young heart, bright are the days of thy wooing, but happier far the days untried, no sorrow can mar when love has tied the knot there's no undoing, then never to part, young heart, then never to part. Enter Lady Sangasia. My child, I join in these congratulations. Heed not the tear that dreams this aged eye. Old memories crowd upon me. Though I sorrow, tis for myself, Aline, and not for thee. Enter Alexis from house, preceded by chorus of men. Chorus of men and women. With heart and with voice, let us welcome this mating. To the maid of his choice, with a heart palpitating, comes Alexis the Brave. Sir Marmaduke enters from house. Lady Sangazior and he exhibit signs of strong emotion at the sight of each other, which they endeavour to repress. Alexis and Aline rush into each other's arms. Oh, my adored one! Beloved boy, ecstatic rapture, unmingled joy. Duet, Sir Marmaduke and Lady Sangasia. Welcome, joy, adieu to sadness, as Aurora gilds the day. So those eyes, twin orbs of gladness, chase the clouds of care away. Irresistible incentive bids me humbly kiss your hand. I'm your servant, most attentive, most attentive to command. Wild with adoration, mad with fascination, to indulge my lamentation, no occasion do I miss. Goaded to distraction, by maddening inaction, I find some satisfaction in apostrophe like this. Sangajor immortal, Sangajor divine, Welcome to my portal, angel, oh, be mine. Irresistible incentive bids me humbly kiss your hand. I'm your servant, most attentive, most attentive to command. Sir, I thank you most politely for your graceful courtesy. Compliment more true knightly never yet was paid to me. Chivalry is an ingredient sadly lacking in our land. Sir, I am your most obedient, most obedient to command. Wild with adoration, mad with fascination, to indulge my lamentation, no occasion do I miss. Goaded to distraction by maddening inaction, I find some satisfaction in apostrophe like this. Marmaduke immortal, Marmaduke divine, take me to thy portal, loved one. Oh, be mine. Chivalry is an ingredient sadly lacking in our land. Sir, I am your most obedient, most obedient to command. During this duet, a small table has been placed upon stage by Mrs. Partlett. The council has entered and prepares marriage contract behind table. Recitative Council All is prepared for sealing and for signing. The contract has been drafted as agreed. Approach the table, O oh ye lovers pining, with hand and seal come execute the deed. Alexis and Aline advance and sign. Alexis supported by Sir Marmaduke, Aline by her mother. 
See they sign without a quiver it, then to seal proceed. They deliver it, they deliver it, as their act and deed. I delivered, I delivered, as my act and deed. I deliver it, I deliver it, as my act and deed. With heart and with voice let us welcome this mating. Leave them here to rejoice with true love palpitating. Alexis the brave and the lovely Aileen. Exeunt all but Alexis and Aline. At last, we are alone. My darling, you are now irrevocably betrothed to me. Are you not very, very happy? Oh, Alexis, can you doubt it? Do I not love you beyond all on earth, and am I not beloved in return? Is not true love faithfully given and faithfully returned the source of every earthly joy? Of that there can be no doubt. Oh, that the world could be persuaded of the truth of that maxim. Oh, that the world could break down the artificial barriers of rank, wealth, education, age, beauty, habits, taste, and temper, and recognize the glorious principle that in marriage alone is to be found the panacea for every ill. Continue to preach that sweet doctrine, and you will succeed, O oh, evangel of true happiness. I hope so, but as yet the cause progresses but slowly. Still, I have made some converts to the principle that men and women should be coupled in matrimony without distinction of rank. I have lectured on the subject at mechanics institutes, and the mechanics were unanimous in favour of my views. I have preached in workhouses, beer shops, and lunatic asylums, and I have been received with enthusiasm. I have addressed navvies on the advantage that would accrue to them if they married wealthy ladies of rank, and not a navvy dissented. Noble fellows, and yet there are those who hold that the uneducated classes are not open to argument. And what do the countesses say? Why, at present it can't be denied. The aristocracy hold aloof. The working man is the true intelligence after all. He is a noble creature when he is quite sober. Yes, Aileen, true happiness comes of true love, and true love should be independent of external influences. It should live upon itself, and by itself, in itself, should live for love alone. Ballad. Love feeds on many kinds of food I know. Some love for rank, and some for duty. Some give their hearts away for empty show, and others love for youth and beauty. To love for money, all the world is prone. Some love themselves, and live all lonely. Give me the love that loves for love alone. I love that love, I love it only. What man for any other joy can thirst? Whose loving wife adores him duly, want, misery, and care may do their worst, if loving woman loves you truly. A lover's thoughts are ever with his own, none truly loved is ever lonely. Give me the love that loves for love alone, I love that love, I love it only. Oh, Alexis, those are noble principles. Yes, Aileen, and I'm going to take a desperate step in support of them. Have you ever heard of the firm of J. W. Wells & Company, the old established family sorcerers in St. Mary Axe? I have seen their advertisement. They have invented a filtra, which if report may be believed, it is simply infallible. I intend to distribute it through the village, and within half an hour of my doing so, there will not be an adult in the place who will not have learnt the secret of pure and lasting happiness. What do you say to that? Well, dear, of course a filter is a very useful thing in a house, quite indispensable in the present state of Thames water, but I still don't quite see that it is the sort of thing that places its possessor on the very pinnacle of earthly joy. Aileen, you misunderstand me. I didn't say a filter. I said a filter. So did I, dear. I said filter. No, dear. You said a filter. I don't mean a filter. I mean a filtra. P.H., you know. A line, alarmed. You don't mean a love potion. On the contrary, I do mean a love potion. Oh, Alexis, I don't think it would be right. I don't indeed. And then, a real magician. Oh, it would be downright wicked. Aileen, is it? 
Or is it not a laudable object to steep the whole village up to its lips in love, and to couple them in matrimony without distinction of age, rank, or fortune? Unquestionably, but... Then, unpleasant as it must be to have recourse to supernatural aid, I must nevertheless pocket my aversion in deference to the great and good end I have in view. Calling. Hercules! Enter a page from tent. Yes, sir? Is Mr. Wells there? He's in the tent, sir. Refreshing. Ask him to be so good as to step this way. Yes, sir. Exit page. Oh, but Alexis, a real sorcerer. Oh, I shall be frightened to death. I trust my Aileen will not yield to fear, while the strong right arm of her Alexis is here to protect her. It's nonsense, dear, to talk of your protecting me with your strong right arm in the face of the fact that this family sorcerer could change me into a guinea pig before you could turn around. He could change you into a guinea pig, no doubt. But it is most unlikely that he would take such liberty. It's a most respectable firm, and I am sure he would never be guilty of so uncrazeman-like an act. Enter Mr. Wells from Tent. Good day, sir. A line, much terrified. Good day. I believe you are a sorcerer. Yes, sir. We practice necromancy in all its branches. We've a choice assortment of wishing caps, divining rods, amulets, charms, and counter charms. We can cast you in nativity at a low figure, and we have a horoscope at three and six that we can guarantee. Our Abuda chest, each containing a patent hag who comes out and prophesizes disasters, with spring complete, are strongly recommended. Our Aladdin lamps are very chaste, and our prophetic tablets, foretelling everything, from a change of ministry down to a rise in Turkish stock, are much inquired for. Our penny curse, one of the cheapest things in the trade, is considered infallible. We have some very superior blessings, too but they're very little asked for. We've only sold one since Christmas, to a gentleman who bought it to send to his mother-in-law, but it turned out that he was afflicted in the head and it's been returned on our hands. But our sale of penny curses, especially on Saturday nights, is tremendous. We can't turn them out fast enough. Oh, my name is John Wellington Wells. I'm a dealer in magic and spells. In blessings and curses, and ever-filled purses, in prophecies, witches, and knells. If you want a proud foe to make tracks, if you'd melt a rich uncle in wax, you have but to look in on our resident gin, number 70, Simmery Axe. We've a first-class assortment of magic, and for raising a posthumous shade, with effects that are comic or tragic, there's no cheaper house in the trade. Love filter, we've quantities of it, and for knowledge if any one burns, we keep an extremely small profit, who brings us unbounded returns. Oh, he can prophesy, with a wink of his eye, peep with security into futurity, sum up your history, clear up a mystery, humor proclivity, for a nativity, for a nativity, mirror so magical, Tetrapods tragical, bogey spectacular, answers oracular, facts astronomical, solemn or comical, and if you want it, he makes a reduction on taking a quantity. Oh, if anyone anything lacks, he'll find it already in stacks, if he'll only look in on the resident gin, number 70, Simmery Axe. He can raise you hosts of ghost, and that without reflectors, and creepy things with wings, and gaunt and grisly spectres. He can fill you crowds of shrouds, and horrify you vastly. He can rack your brain with chains, and gibberings grim and ghastly. Then, if you plan it, he changes organity with an urbanity, full of satanity, vexes humanity, with an inanity fatal to vanity, driving your foes to the verge of insanity, Barring tauntology in demonology, electrobiology, mystic nosology, spirit philology, high class astrology, such is his knowledge, he isn't a man to require an apology. Oh, my name is John Wellington Wells, 
I'm a dealer in magic and spells, in blessings and curses and ever-filled purses, in prophecies, witches, and knells. If anyone anything lacks, he'll find it already in stacks, if he'll only look in on the resident gin, number seventy, Semery Axe. I have sent for you to consult you on a very important matter. I believe you advertise a patent oxy hydrogen love at first sight filtra. Sir, it is our leading article. Producing a file. Now I want to know if you can confidently guarantee it as possessing all the qualities you claim for it in your advertisement. Sir, we are not in the habit of puffing our goods. Ours is an old established house with a large family connection and every assurance held out in the advertisement is fully realized. Aline aside. Oh, Alexis, don't offend him. He'll change us into something dreadful. I know he will. I am anxious from purely philanthropical motives to distribute this filtra secretly among the inhabitants of this village. I shall, of course, require a quantity. How do you sell it? In buying a quantity, sir... We should strongly advise your taking it in the wood, and drawing it off as you happen to want it. We have it in four and a half and nine gallon casks, also in pipes and hogsheads for laying down, and we deduct ten per cent for prompt cash. Oh, Alexis, surely you don't want to lay any down. Aileen, the villagers will assemble to carouse in a few minutes. Go and fetch the teapot. But, Alexis... My dear, you must obey me. If you please, go and fetch the teapot. Aline going. I'm sure Dr. Daly would disapprove it. Exit Aline into tent. And how soon does it take effect? In half an hour. Whoever drinks of it falls in love, as a matter of course, with the first lady he meets who has also tasted it, and his affection is at once returned. One trial will prove the fact. Enter Aline from tent with large teapot. Good. Then, Mr. Wells, I shall feel obliged if you will at once pour as much filtra into this teapot as will suffice to affect the whole village. But bless me, Alexis. Many of the villagers are married people. Madam, this filter is compounded on the strictest principles. On married people, it has no effect whatever. But are you quite sure that you have nerve enough to carry you through the fearful ordeal? In the good cause I fear nothing. Very good. Then we will proceed at once to the incantation. The stage grows dark. Sprites of earth and air, fiends of flame and fire, demon souls come here in shoals, this dreadful deed inspire. Up here, up here, up here. Good master, we are here. Noisome hags of night, imps of deadly shade, pallid ghosts, arise in host, and lend me all your aid. Up here, up here, up here. Good master, we are here. Alexis aside. Hark, they assemble, those fiends of the night. Aline aside. Oh, Alexis, I tremble, I seek safety in flight. Let us fly to a far-off land where peace and plenty dwell, where the sigh of the silver strand is echoed in every shell. To the joy that land will give, on the wings of love will fly, in innocence there to live, in innocence there to die. Chorus of Spirits Too, too late, too, too late, late, it may not, not be. be. That, that happy fate, fate is, is not, not for thee. Too late, too late, late that, that may not be. That happy, happy fate is not for me. thee. Now shriveled hags with poison bags Discharge your loathsome loads. Spit flame and fire, unholy choir, Belch forth your venom toads. Ye demons fell with yelp and yell, Shed curses far afield. Ye fiends of night, your filthy blight in noisome plenty yield. Mr. Wells pouring file into teapot. Flash. Number one. It, it is, is done. done. Mr. Wells pouring file into teapot. Flash. Number two. One, one too, too few. few. 
Mr. Wells pouring file into teapot. Flash. Number three. Set, set us free, set us free, our work is done. <laughs> set us free, our course is run. <laughs> Aline and Alexis aside. Let us fly to a far off land where peace and plenty dwell, where the sigh of the silver strand is echoed in every shell. Chorus of Fiends. <laughs> Stage grows light. Mr. Wells beckons villagers. Enter villagers and all the dramatis personae, dancing joyously. Sir Marmaduke enters with Lady Sangazure from house. Vicar enters absorbed in thought. He is followed by Constance. Council enters, followed by Mrs. Partlett. Mrs. Partlett and Mr. Wells distribute teacups. Chorus. Now to the banquet we press, now, now for the, the eggs, the ham, now, now for the mustard and cress, now, now for the strawberry jam, now, now for the tea of our host, now, now for the rollicking bun, now, now for the muffin and toast, now, now for the gay Sally Lunn, the eggs and the ham and the strawberry jam, the rollicking bun and the gay Sally Lunn. The rollicking, rollicking bun. Recitative, Sir Marmaduke. Be happy, all. The feast is spread before ye. Fear nothing but enjoy yourselves, I pray. Eat, I, and drink, be merry, I implore ye. For once let thoughtless folly rule the day. Teacup, Brindisi. Eat, drink, and be gay. Banish all worry and sorrow. Laugh gaily today, weep if you're sorry tomorrow. Come pass the cup round, I will go bail for the liquor. It's strong, I'll be bound, for it was brewed by the vicar. None so knowing as he, at brewing a jorum of tea, ha ha, pretty stiff jorum of tea. Trio, Mr. Wells, Aline and Alexis, aside. See, 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 they, they drink, drink, all thought, thought unheeding, teacups clink, clink, they are exceeding. Their hearts will melt in half an hour, hour. then, then will, will be felt the potion's power. During this verse, Constance has brought a small teapot, kettle, caddy and cosy to Dr. Daly. He makes tea scientifically. Pain, trouble, and care, misery, heartache, and worry. Quick, out of your lair, get you all gone in a hurry. Toil, sorrow, and plot, fly away quicker and quicker. Three spoons to the pot, that is the brew of your vicar. None, None so cunning, cunning as he, at, at brewing a jorum of tea, tea. ha <laughs> ha, a pretty <laughs> stiff jorum of tea. tea. Dr. Daly places teapot on tray, held by Constance. He covers it with the cosy. She takes tray into the house. Ensemble, Alexis and Aline aside. O oh love, true love, unworldly abiding, source of all pleasure, true fountain of joy. O oh love, true love, divinely confiding, exquisite treasure that knows no alloy. O oh, love, true love, rich harvest of gladness, peace-bearing tillage, great garner of bliss. O oh, love, true love, look down on our sadness, dwell in this village, O oh, hear us in this. It becomes evident by the strange conduct of the characters that the charm is working. All rub their eyes. Two tea aside. O oh, marvellous illusion, O oh, terrible surprise! What is the strange confusion that veils my aching eyes? I must, I must regain, regain my senses, restoring reason's law. Or, or fearful inferences, the company, the company will draw. Alexis, Mr. Wells and Aline aside. A marvellous illusion, a terrible surprise, excites a strange confusion within their aching eyes. They must regain their senses, restoring reason's law. Or our fearful inferences, the company will draw. Those who have partaken of the filter struggle against its effects, 
and resume the Brindisi with a violent effort. Eat, drink, and be gay. Banish all worry and sorrow. Laugh gaily today. Weep if you're sorry tomorrow. Come, pass the cup round. We will go bail for the liquor. It's strong, I'll be bound. For it was brewed by the vicar. None so cunning is he. At brewing a jorum of tea. Ha ha. At brewing a jorum of tea. End of Act One. Act Two of The Sorcerer by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene Marketplace in the village. Rustic houses. In centre a market cross. Enter peasants dancing, coupled two and two. An old man with a young girl, then an old woman with a young man, then other ill-assorted couples. Happy are we in our loving frivolity, happy and jolly as people of quality. Love is the source of all joy to humanity, money, position and rank are of vanity. Year after year we've been waiting and tarrying, without ever dreaming of loving and marrying. Though we've been hitherto deaf, dumb and blind to it, it's pleasant enough when you've made up your mind to it. Enter Constance, leading notary. Dear friends, take pity on my lot. My cup is not of nectar. I long have loved, as who would not, our kind and reverend rector. Long years ago my love began, so sweetly, yet so sadly. But when I saw this plain old man, Away my old affection ran. I found I loved him madly. Oh, to notary. You very, very plain old man. I love, I love you madly. You, you very, very plain, plain old man. man. She, she loves, loves, she loves, loves you madly. I am a very deaf old man and hear you very badly. I know not why I love him so. It is enchantment, surely. He's dry and snuffy, deaf and slow, ill-tempered, weak and poorly. He's ugly and absurdly dressed, and sixty-seven nearly. He's everything that I detest, but if the truth must be confessed, I love him very dearly. Oh, you're everything that I detest, but still I love you dearly. You're everything that girls detest. But, but still, still she loves, loves you dearly. I caught that line, but for the rest, I did not hear it clearly. During this verse, Aline and Alexis have entered at back unobserved. Oh joy, oh joy, the charm works well, and all are now united. The blind young boy obeys the spell, the troth they all have plighted. Oh joy, oh joy, oh joy the, the charm, charm works, works well, well and, and all are now united. The blind young boy obeys the spell, the truth they all have plighted. True happiness reigns everywhere and dwells with both the sexes, and all will bless the thoughtful care of their beloved Alexis. Oh bitter joy, no words can tell how my poor heart is blighted. They'll soon employ a marriage bell to say that we're united. I do confess a sorrow rare my humbled spirit vexes, and none will bless example rare of their beloved Alexis. O oh joy, O oh joy, no words can tell my state of mind delighted. They'll soon employ a marriage bell to say that we're united. True happiness reigns everywhere, and dwells with both the sexes, and all will bless example rare of their beloved Alexis. All except Alexis and Aline dance off to symphony. How joyful they all seem in their newfound happiness! The whole village has paired off in the happiest manner, and yet not a match has been made that the hollow woe would not consider ill-advised. But we have wiser, far wiser, than the world. 
to observe the good that will become of these ill-assorted unions. The miserly wife will check the reckless expenditure of her too frivolous consort. The wealthy husband will shower innumerable bonnets on his penniless bride. And the young and lively spouse will cheer the declining days of her aged partner with comic songs unceasing. What a delightful prospect for him! But one thing remains to be done, that my happiness may be complete. We must drink the filtra ourselves, that I may be assured of your love for ever and ever. Oh, Alexis, do you doubt me? Is it necessary that such love as ours should be secured by artificial means? Oh, no, no, no! My dear Aileen, time works terrible changes, and I want to place our love beyond the chance of change. Alexis, it is already far beyond that chance. Have faith in me, for my love can never, never change. Then you absolutely refuse? I do. If you cannot trust me, you have no right to love me, no right to be loved by me. Enough, Aileen. I shall know how to interpret this refusal. Thou hast the power, thy vaunted love, to sanctify or doubt above, despite the gathering shade, to make that love of thine so sure, that come what may it must endure. Till time itself shall fade, thy love is but a flower, that fades within the hour. If such thy love, O oh shame, call it by other name, it is not love. Thine is the power, and thine alone, to place me on so proud a throne, that kings might envy me, a priceless throne of love untold, more rare than orient pearl and gold. But no, thou wouldst be free, such love is like the ray, that dies within the day. If such thy love, O oh shame, call it by other name, it is not love. Enter Dr. Daly. It is singular, it is very singular. It has overthrown all my calculations. It is distinctly opposed to the doctrine of averages. I cannot understand it. Dear Dr. Daly, what has puzzled you? My dear, this village has not hitherto been addicted to marrying and giving in marriage. Hitherto the youths of this village have not been enterprising, and the maidens have been distinctly coy. Judge, then, of my surprise when I tell you that the whole village came to me in a body just now, and implored me to join them in matrimony, with as little delay as possible. Even your excellent father has hinted to me that, before very long, it is not unlikely that he also may change his condition. Oh, Alexis, do you hear that? Are you not delighted? Yes. I confess that a union between your mother and my father would be a happy circumstance indeed. Crossing to Dr. Daly. My dear sir, the news that you bring us is very gratifying. Yes, still in my eyes it has its melancholy side. This universal marrying recalls the happy days, now, alas, gone forever, when I myself might have... But tush, I am pooling... I am too old to marry, and yet, within the last half hour, I have greatly yearned for companionship. I never remarked it before, but the young maidens of this village are very comely. So, likewise, are the middle-aged, also the elderly. All are comely, and uh, all are engaged. Here comes your father. Enter Sir Marmaduke with Mrs. Partlet, arm in arm. Mrs. Mrs. Partlet? Dr. Daly, give me joy. Alexis, my dear boy, you will, I am sure, be pleased to hear that my declining days are not unlikely to be solaced by the companionship of this good, virtuous, and amiable woman. My dear father, this is not altogether what I expected. I am certainly taken somewhat by surprise. Still, it can hardly be necessary to assure you that any wife of yours is a mother of mine. Aside to Aline. It is not quite what I would have wished. Mrs. Partlet crossing to Alexis. Oh, sir, I entreat your forgiveness. I am aware that socially I am not everything that could be desired, 
nor am I blessed with an abundance of worldly goods. But I can at least confer on your estimable father the great and priceless dowry of a true, tender, and loving heart. I do not question it. After all, a faithful love is the true source of every earthly joy. I knew that my boy would not blame his poor father for acting on the impulse of a heart that has never yet misled him. Zora is not, perhaps, what the world called beautiful. Still, she is comely. Distinctly comely. Ah. Zora is very good and very clean and honest and quite sober in her habits, and that is worth far more than beauty, dear Sir Marmaduke. Yes, beauty will fade and perish, but personal cleanliness is practically undying, for it can be renewed whenever it discovers symptoms of decay. My dear Sir Marmaduke, I heartily congratulate you. <sighs> Quintet, Alexis, Aline, Sir Marmaduke, Zora, and Dr. Daly. I rejoice that it's decided happy now will be his life for my father is provided with a true and tender wife. She will tend him, nurse him, mend him, ere his linen dries his tears. Bless the thoughtful fate that sent him such a wife to soothe his years. No young, giddy, thoughtless maiden, full of graces, airs and cheers, but a sober widow laden with the weight of fifty years. No high-born exacting beauty, blazing like a jeweled sun, but a wife who'll do her duty, as that duty should be done. I'm no saucy minx and giddy, hussies such as they abound, but a clean and tidy witty, well be known for miles around. All the village now have mated, all are happy as can be, I to live alone am fated. No one's left to marry me. She will tend him, nurse him, mend him, ere his linen dries his tears. Bless the thoughtful fate that sent him such a wife to soothe his years. Exeunt Sir Marmaduke and Mrs. Partlet, Aline and Alexis. Dr. Daly looks after them sentimentally, then exit with a sigh. Mr. Wells who has overheard part of this quintet and who has remained concealed behind the market cross, comes down as they go off. Oh, I have wrought much evil with my spells, an ill I can't undo. This is too bad of you, J.W. Wells. What wrong have they done you? And see, another lovelorn lady comes. Alas, poor stricken dame, a gentle pensiveness her life benumbs, and mine alone the blame. Sits at foot of Market Cross. Lady Sangazure enters. She is very melancholy. Alas, ah, me, and well a day. I sigh for love, and well I may, for I am very old and grey. But stay. Sees Mr. Wells and becomes fascinated by him. What is this very form I see before me? Oh, horrible. She's going to adore me. This last catastrophe is overpowering. Why do you glare at me with the visage lowering? For pity's sake, recoil not thus from me. My lady, leave me. This may never be. Hate me, I draw my H's, have through life. Love me, I'll drop them too. Hate me, I always eat peas with a knife. Love me, I'll eat like you. Hate me, I spend the day at Rocheville. Love me, that joy I'll share. Hate me, I often roll down one tree hill. Love me, I'll join you there. Love me, my prejudices I will drop. Hate me, that's not enough. Love me, I'll come and help you in the shop. Hate me, 
the life is rough. Love me. My grandma, I will all forswear. Hate me, abjure my lot. Love me, I'll stick sunflowers in my hair. Hate me, they'll suit you not. At what I am going to say, be not enraged. I may not love you, for I am engaged. Engaged? Engaged to a maiden fair, with bright brown hair and a sweet and simple smile, who waits for me by the sounding sea on a South Pacific isle. Aside. A lie. No maiden waits me there. She has bright brown hair. A lie. No maiden smiles on me. By the sounding sea. Oh, agony, rage, despair. The maiden has bright brown hair, and mine is as white as snow. False man, it will be your fault. If I go to my family vault and bury my lifelong woe. Oh, agony, rage, despair. Oh, where will this end? Oh, where? I should like very much to know. It will certainly be my fault if she goes to her family vault to bury her lifelong woe. The, the family, family vault. vault. The, the family, family vault. vault. It, it will certainly be my fault, fault if she I goes to her family, family vault, vault to bury, bury my her lifelong woe. woe. Exit Lady Sangazio in great anguish. Oh, hideous doom to scatter desolation, and sow the seeds of sorrow far and wide, to foster malances through the nation, and drive high-born old dames to suicide. Shall I subject myself to reprobation by leaving her in solitude to pine? No, come what may, I'll make her reparation. So, aged lady, take me, I am thine. Exit, Mr. Wells. Enter, Aline. This was meant to have been the happiest day of my life, but I am far from happy. Alexis insists that I taste a filcher, and when I try to persuade him that to do so would be an insult to my pure and lasting love, he tells me that I object because I do not desire that my love for him shall be eternal. Well, sighing and producing a file, I can at least prove to him that in that he is unjust. Alexis, doubt me not, my loved one. See thine uttered will is sovereign law to me. All fear, all thought of ill I cast away. It is my darling's will and I obey. She drinks the filter. The fearful deed is done. My love is near. I go to meet my own in trembling fear. If o'er us aught of ill should cast a shade, it was my darling's will and I obeyed. As Aline is going off, she meets Dr. Daly, entering pensively. He is playing on a flageolet. Under the influence of the spell, she at once becomes strangely fascinated by him and exhibits every symptom of being hopelessly in love with him. Oh, my voice is sad and low, and with timid step I go, for with the load of love o'erladen, I inquire of every maiden, will you wed me, little lady, will you share my cottage shady? Little lady answers, no, thank you for your kindly proffer, good your heart and fool your coffer, yet I must decline your offer, I'm engaged to so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Flageolet. She's engaged to so-and-so, what a rogue young heart to pillage, what a worker on love's tillage. Every maiden in the village is engaged to so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Flageolet. All engaged to so-and-so. 
At the end of the song, Dr. Daly sees Aline and, under the influence of the potion, falls in love with her. Oh, joyous boon, oh, mad delight, oh, sun and moon, oh, day and night. Rejoice, rejoice with me, proclaim our joy, ye birds above, ye brooklets murmur forth our love in choral ecstasy. Oh, joyous boon, Boon. Oh, mad delight. Oh, sun and moon. Oh, day and night. Ye birds and brooks and fruitful trees, with choral joy delight the breeze. Rejoice, rejoice with me. Enter Alexis. Aileen, my only love, my happiness, the filtra, you have tasted it? Yes, yes. Oh, joy mine, mine for ever and for I. Embraces her. Alexis, don't do that. You must not. Dr. Daly interposes between them. Why? Alas, that lovers thus should meet. Oh, pity, pity me. Oh, charge me not with cold deceit. Oh, pity, pity me. You bade me drink with trembling awe. I drank and by the potion's law, I loved the very first I saw. Oh, pity, pity me. My dear young friend, consoled be, we pity, pity you. In this I am not an agent free, we pity, pity you. Some most extraordinary spell o'er us has cast its magic fell. The consequences I need not tell, we pity, pity you. Some most extraordinary spell o'er oh, us has cast its magic fell. The consequence we need not tell. They pity, pity me. False one, be gone, I spurn thee. To thy new love turn thee. Thy perfidy all men know. I could not help it. Alexis calling off. Come one, come all. We could not help it. Obey my call. I could not help it. Come hither, run. We could not help it. Come everyone. Enter all the characters, except Lady Sangazure and Mr. Wells. Oh, what, what is, is the matter, matter and what, what is, is the clatter? clatter? He's glowering at her and threatens a blow. Oh, why, why does, does he batter, batter the girl he did flatter? And why, why does the latter recoil from him so? Prepare for sad surprises, my love Aileen despises. No thought of sorrow shames her, another lover claims her. Be his, false girl, for better or for worse. But ere you leave me, may a lover's curse. Hold! Dr. Daly coming forward. Be just. This poor child drank the filtre at your insistence. She hurried off to meet you, but most unhappily she met me instead. As you had administered the potion to both of us, the result was inevitable. But fear nothing from me. I will be no man's rival. I shall quit the country at once, and bury my sorrow in the congenial gloom of a colonial bishopric. My excellent old friend. Taking his hand, then turning to Mr. Wells, who has entered with Lady Sangazure. Oh, Mr. Wells, what, what is to be done? I do not know, and yet there is one means by which this spell may be removed. Name it, oh, name it. Or you or I must yield up his life to Arimenes. I would rather it were you. I should have no hesitation in sacrificing my own life to spare yours, but we take stock next week, and it would not be fair on the company. True. Well, I am ready. No, no, Alexis, it must not be. Mr. Wells, if he must die, that all may be restored to their old loves. What is to become of me? I should be left out in the cold with no love to be restored to. True, true, I did not think of that. To the others. My friends, I appeal to you, and I will leave the decision in your hands. Or I, or he, must die. Which shall it be? Reply. Die thou. Thou art the cause of all offending. 
die thou. Yield thou to this decree unbending. Die thou. Die thou. Die thou. So be it, I submit, my fate is sealed. To popular opinion, thus I yield. Falls. Be happy all, leave me to my despair. I go, it matters not with whom or where. Gong. All quit their present partners and rejoin their old lovers. Sir Marmaduke leaves Mrs. Partlet and goes to Lady Sangajour. Aline leaves Dr. Daly and goes to Alexis. Dr. Daly leaves Aline and goes to Constance. Notary leaves Constance and goes to Mrs. Partlet. All the chorus make a corresponding change. Oh, oh my, my lord, lord one. one. Unmingled joy. Ecstatic rapture. Beloved boy. They embrace. Come to my mansion, all of you. At least we'll crown our rapture with another feast. Now, now to, to the, the banquet, banquet we press. press. Now, now for the eggs and ham. Now, ham. now for, for the mustard and cress. Press. Now for the strawberry jam. Now to the banquet we press. Now for the eggs and the ham. Now for the mustard and cress. Now for the strawberry jam. Now for the tea of our host. Now for the rollicking bun. Now for the muffin and toast. Now for the gay salon. Now for the tea of our host. Now for the rollicking bun. Now for the muffin and toast. Now for the gay Sally Lunn. General Dance. End of Act Two. End of The Sorcerer by W.S. Gilbert.